Today, I'm going to speak on Deuteronomy, and specifically Deuteronomy 19. We had a good sermon last week by Pastor Isaac, who spoke on the move of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost, the Passover, the harvest, the festival of harvest. It was fantastic. Oh, how many of you were blessed last week by the, by the message? Right, I can see many hands being lifted. Good, you are an enthusiastic crowd. I like that. You all respond to it. Well, great. But we started this evening with a great worship. We talked about God. We sang about God. God is great. God has done so many things. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Amen. Amen. He's the one that we can always turn to in any time. In times when even good times, bad times, when times when you're really in deep, deep trouble. Even times when you are considered to be a fugitive. A fugitive? How come I'm talking about fugitive? Well, let me show you the next slide. It's a slide ready. How many of you have seen this movie before? The Fugitive. How many of you have seen it before? Quite a number of hands, right. I can safely say that those that raised their hands was probably of the age group that says, well, age is only a number. Okay, this is quite an old movie. But The Fugitive is still a movie worth watching. You can still catch it on Netflix or Astro. The main character is Dr. Richard Kimball over there. He is played by none other than Harrison Ford, but that's not important. It's about the character. The good doctor has become a fugitive from the law. He has become a fugitive from the law. Hence the title, The Fugitive. The movie is about him. And he's being pursued by a group of people. Who are they? They are a team of US Marshals, led by none other than a character called Samuel Gerard. A role played by Tommy Lee Jones, who was dead keen to bring Kimball back dead or alive. Like the 40 Jews who swore to kill um, Paul without, fast, without eating, and they fast, and they would not eat or drink until he killed Paul. They were that determined to bring Dr. Kimball in. Kimball was a surgeon in the, in the movie, accused of covering up his own wife's murder with a violent break-in and later sentenced to death by the law courts. But he escaped while on the way to the death row in prison. And this block, whole blockbuster, the whole movie, consists of a high adrenaline pursuit of this innocent doctor who tries to find refuge from the law. There are twists and turns to the plot, but I won't tell you the ending. Lest you might want to watch the movie for yourself. But what I can and will tell you is this. Art is a mirror of reality. Art is a mirror of reality. Very often, what we see in the movies, in the cineplexes, on YouTube, or even on the media resources, reflect what happens in real life. This movie was inspired by the true story of Dr. Sam Shepard, the part that you saw on the slide just now on the other side. He was a neurosurgeon. He's a real person. Years ago, convicting of committing his wife's murder and was subsequently sentenced to life imprisonment. But instead of being a fugitive from the law, he stayed in prison. And 10 years later, new evidence was unearthed that proved his innocence and his conviction was overturned. The real Dr. Shepard found refuge instead in a good company of lawyers who unearthed this evidence declaring his innocence through the courts of law. The Kimbos and Shepherds of today are not rare. They are not isolated. They are not over-dramatized people, whether they are in fiction or in real life. They could easily have been the Kims of Korea, the Shahs of India, or even the Kamaruddins of Malaysia. That people around us, even perhaps maybe seated next to you, are every day on trial, on the run, for actions or crimes attributed to them that they could possibly be innocent of. Have you ever felt like that before? That you've been wrongly accused of something which you've never done, and yet people keep on pointing their fingers at you? Could it be that I'm speaking about someone in this hall this evening, or perhaps someone who's logged on online for this service right now? In the situations I mentioned, no matter whether it be fictional or in real life, a heinous crime has been committed. A murder has happened. Someone's life has been lost. And the perpetrator has to be found and the punishment meted out. There's a saying that goes like this. Justice must be done and not only done but has to be seen to be done. Justice must be done and has to be seen to be done. The Bible in Deuteronomy 19, 21 says this, Show no pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. 
echoing Exodus 21-24 in accordance to the Mosaic law. Yes, justice must be seen to be done, but often the raw passion in carrying it out may render justice herself blind to the fallout from its implementation. What do I mean by that? Take the statue of justice, for example. There is a very common statue called the Lady Justice statue. Often it portrays a lady holding the scales on one hand and a sword on the other, saying that things ought to be weighed and the punishment ought to be turned out. But there's something over her face. Often, not always, but quite often you see that. What is that thing? A blindfold. A blindfold over her face. Why? Is justice blind? No. The blindfold is meant to represent the stoicism of the objectivity in which justice should be met. But sometimes, this same blindfold often masks out compassion and mercy. It blocks out compassion and mercy while exercising justice. The Mosaic Law, like other divine commands and precepts given through God's servant and friend Moses, in its pure form, is perfect. It's perfect. But it's filtered down through imperfect human instruments like languages and the different interpretations until it becomes corrupted and can be seen to be extremely harsh in its implementation. This would be one reason why Jesus himself spoke against this in relation to divorce in Matthew 19, verse 8. He said this, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And Jesus also had to make another reference to this harsh implementation of justice in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 42. So as to curb the blind fury of retaliation in the application of what we call lex talionis, or the law of retaliation. Lex talionis, meaning an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. This law of retaliation states that the punishment should resemble the offence committed in kind and degree. Let me repeat that. Lex Talionis states that the punishment meted out should resemble the offence committed in kind and degree. Hence, the eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And seemingly, it originated from Exodus 21-24 that I mentioned earlier. Jesus always has mentioned this. He said this in Matthew 5, 38-42 uh, in relation to Exodus 21-24. He says this, you have heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek. And also, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. No wonder so many lawyers sometimes go in t-shirts. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Jesus called those who tried to apply lex talionis, the law of retaliation, as, what did he call them? Good persons? Good-hearted? No. He called them evil. He called them evil. In verse 39, isn't it interesting that it came actually from the Mosaic law? All the more, this law is still presently promoted in many parts of the world, including in Asia, Africa, Middle East, amongst the other faiths. Does that not lend credence to the fact, to the truth that no matter what God intends for good, mankind in its fallen state can turn it around for evil. Let me repeat that. Does not lend credence to the truth that no matter what God meant for good, mankind in its fallen state still turns it around for evil. Does this thought make you angry sometimes? Remember those times you were sitting in your car, you were in a long queue, and someone cuts in and... <laughs> Sorry, I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor. Shouldn't feel that. No, but we do. We do feel that. Because in this day and age, we want to see justice done. At least for the large majority of us. How many of us here want to see justice done? Yes. Well, I do see half the hall not lifting up a hand. So, dear, I hope you're in good company. But... We all want to see justice done, don't we? From the big-time crooks in 1MDB, we want to see them brought to justice. And even, as I said, to the road bullies that come in, we wish that they won't exist 
you know, and also to the foreign workers that we see being exploited by many of our Malaysian bosses for peanuts. Oh, it gets our blood boiling sometimes. But you might be telling yourself that this anger is not the wrong kind. It's the right kind of anger. It's the righteous anger that even Jesus himself portrayed in the temple courts, outer courts. He overturned the traders and he got rid of them, he chased them out and kicked them out. Oh, Jesus was angry. That's righteous anger. So I think it's okay to be angry this way. But sometimes this passion for justice might even ask, must even force us to, to pray, Lord, Lord, can you please exterminate? No, 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 not exterminate. Eliminate. Get rid of, simply get rid of all those evil people that cause all your wonderful good works to go to waste and even bring about such pain and suffering, Lord. Have you all prayed this prayer before? I hope not. So <laughs> I hope not. Because be careful when you ask for justice. Be careful when you ask for justice. Can you be sure that when God removes this restraint of mercy and allow you to feel the full wrath of His justice, you will still be around? I would still be around. I'm not that sure. Now, just hold that thought there for a moment and I'll come back to it later. So coming back to Deuteronomy 19, God in His sovereignty and wisdom, having foreseen all this flawed application of the law, have already made provision for the individual. In a, those individuals that are in a somewhat desperate situation, a bloodshed has happened, a life has been lost. So they have to find a recourse, a way out. God has made a provision for that way back in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 19, Scripture details how God has provided places of refuge for the fallen and the desperate fugitives in the form of, one, physical shelters as cities of refuge that are accessible, safe, and offer protection. And within the cities, too, there is a judiciary system that's been set up, one of the earliest judiciary systems, where there is fair assessment involving the priests, the judges, and the witnesses. So for today's impartation from the Deuteronomy series, I'm going to share just from Deuteronomy 19 on God's gracious provision of refuge for those seeking recourse for both justice and mercy out of a situation, not of their own doing. And while we're in it, I want us also to see that through drawing parallels, it's far more important for those seeking refuge to not just find it in God's provision, but to look beyond it to the provider that originates both justice and mercy. In other words, look not just for the provision, but the provider. Look beyond the material to the spiritual. Amen, brother. Thanks for agreeing with me. Look beyond the material to the spiritual. Amen. Let us pray for God's guidance on this. I feel that we need to commit this to the Lord. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord God, that you've spoken so powerfully through your Holy Spirit last week, Lord God. You moved the whole church, even in response to you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that your Spirit is alive and active, mightier than the two-aged sword, Lord God, dividing between soul and spirit, Lord God. That, Lord God, your Spirit moves in our life, Lord. We pray, Father, today that as we sit beneath the shadow of the cross, the Spirit will illumine your word to us, that I, your servant, may not even add on one iota, one dot to your word, that your word be carried to the ears and the hearts of the listeners by your Spirit, Lord God, and you move powerfully there, Father. We thank you, Lord God, that you are a God of justice and you are a God of mercy. And in that perfect tension, Lord God, you show us your marvellous image of your Son, Jesus. So to that tonight, Lord God, May, Lord, that you become our refuge as we seek your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Deuteronomy 19 is both a reminder and a review from Moses on the application of justice, which is also contained in other parts of the Pentateuch in accordance with the Mosaic Law. It is then followed by the application of just practices in war times in Deuteronomy 20, and justice for the land and for families in Deuteronomy 21. So today we just look at Deuteronomy 19, looking at Moses' emphasis on God's provision of cities of refuge. And in these cities of refuge, there are three striking features which you see on the screen ahead of you. One is that these cities of refuge are able to offer accessibility, two, assurance of safety, 
And three, an assessment followed by a fair trial. But as I said earlier, look not to just what God has provided. These three things God has provided. Look beyond this. That in accessibility, you see God being approachable for help. That in assurance of safety, you see God being able to protect. That in assessment of a fair trial, you see God being absolutely just. Let's explore it together. First, the accessibility to the cities of refuge. That God is approachable for help. Can I read it together with you? Right? Shall we read it together? Deuteronomy 19, verse 1. When the Lord your God has destroyed the nations whose land He's giving you, and when you've driven them out and settled in their towns and houses, then set aside for yourself three cities in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Determine the distances involved and divide into three parts the land your Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance so that a person who kills someone may flee for refuge to one of these cities. If the Lord your God enlarges your territory as He promised an oath to your ancestors and give you the whole land He promised them because you carefully follow all these laws I commanded you today to love the Lord your God and to walk always in obedience to Him, then you are to set aside three more cities. So in total, how many cities are there? Six cities, right? The Lord God has made provision for those in desperate need for both justice, and not only justice, because justice would get them killed because alive for life, but they also want mercy. They want both justice and mercy by commanding the establishment. God has commanded the establishment of these six cities, the names of which are found in, in a cross-reference to Joshua chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. He has ensured that these cities are spread al- ar- around all the tribes of Israel. There are 12 tribes, right? Or 11 and two half tribes. But all the tribes, and each city is placed between one day's distance from each other so that whoever stays within one day's distance can reach a city within one day's journey. And because this is so, because of the life-threatening nature of the bloodshed, of the circumstances that the fugitives are in, because they can be killed within a short period of time in those turbulent times. They will elaborate and strict selection criteria for coming under the protection of these cities. But the very fact that these cities existed and so well planned that God commanded it, it was like a God sent permanent amnesty that provided relief for those that are in need of it, those that need a refuge. Those times were challenging times when law and order were only beginning to be established way before the Israelite kingdoms came into being. So the Israelites here have much to thank God for in His provision of easily accessible refuge. While cities of refuge are divinely inspired organizations and structures, they remain as man made organizations and structures for those in desperate need. I want to show you that God takes a personal interest by putting a God touch, a divine touch on those seeking refuge while turning to Him. By drawing a parallel between the refuge cities and the fugitive, the relationship between this and the relationship between Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, and Ruth. Between the cities and the refugee, and Boaz and Ruth. You're going to see it in a short while. The whole story of Ruth is about how God restores those that look to Him with hope, the God in whom they seek refuge. It all boils down to a relationship between God and built on His covenantal faithfulness. You should read the book of Ruth for yourself, you have the time. But I can tell you the gist of it in relation to finding refuge in God is that Ruth is very much the fugitive. And Boaz, whom she later married, was a refuge she longed to find. Why? Why? eh? Because in the opening chapters of the book of Ruth, Ruth would have been described as a nobody or an outcast in Israelite society. She was a Mobitus, a foreigner, a widow, and literally an orphan too because she left the parents back in Moab to follow Naomi, her Jewish mother-in-law, back to Jerusalem. Ruth ran away from Moab with Naomi to escape a severe famine. She had no food, no money, no land, no home, no title to her name. She was a fugitive. Nobody would care about except 
for God. And I hope that nobody here in this sanctuary or even logged on online is in as bad a situation as Ruth, yeah? But if you are, we would want very much to pray with you later after the service. But coming back to Ruth, upon reaching Israel, God appointed for her to glean food in Boaz's field. Now, gleaning food is stipulated in God's law that anyone who owns a land should leave the corners of the land, the ages of the land, so that the poor, the widow, the foreigner, and the orphans could actually glean from there. And Ruth came. And came to whose land? Whose field? Boaz's field of all the people in the world. Like Pastor Daniel Ho's famous opening line before he shares the gospel, when he sits down on a table at a coffee shop, he says this, of all the 7 billion people in the world, God must have appointed you to sit next to a pastor today. And that was what happened between Ruth and Boaz. God had made Boaz so easily approachable for Ruth to find help. To make a long biblical story short, guess what? Boaz sacrificed on his part. He's He's, he's a renowned man, you know, he's quite an important man in that city. He lowered himself down, he sacrificed himself on his part to become Ruth's kinsman redeemer by becoming her husband. And boom, all of at once, Ruth found her refuge, found her salvation plan, found everything she longed for in this marital and covenantal relationship. In fact, Boaz, her husband by then, also realized this because he said in Ruth chapter 2, verse 12, May the Lord repay you, Ruth, for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And guess again, what greater honour came to Ruth? She later went on to become the great-grandmother to whom? King David, that's right, the great-grandmother to King David. She became the great-grandmother to King David. Praise the Lord! And she was included in the family lineage of the Lord Jesus Himself. God honours those that come to seek refuge in Him by making Himself approachable to them, as Boaz made Himself approachable to Ruth. Similarly, Boaz can be taken as a type for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is God the Redeemer, who made Himself available and approachable to anyone that makes a turnaround from the sinful selves and desires to seek refuge in Him. Hallelujah! There is a newcomer at the SIBKL Church plant, workplace at the river, who has a tragic background, like the biblical roof. No, she isn't a Mobitis, but she's a Malaysian. But from birth, as an only child, she was totally abandoned by her parents. And the grandmother took her in for a while, just a while only, because she could not care for her for long due to her advancing age and limited financial resources. Then, she was placed under the loving care of a pastor and a wife, who also ran an orphanage in the neighbourhood. This little baby, who is today a bubbly young adult, found her refuge and home in the orphanage under God's provision. It was also there that she experienced of God's love through the pastor's couple that have become as parents to her. The pastor has since gone home to the Lord, but the orphanage today is still thriving and continues to be a channel of God's love to others. Now this young lady tells me just recently that she goes back to the orphanage regularly to make herself available to help others as much as she has experienced Jesus' redeeming love herself. Isn't Jesus our Redeemer God so good in making Himself close to those that seek refuge in Him? Let's give Jesus a tremendous love offering. This is what He does every day all over the world. Hallelujah. Jesus is marvellous, isn't He? You know the second point, the assurance of safety at the cities of refuge shows that God, not only is He making Himself available, but He's also able to protect. Deuteronomy 19 verse 4 onwards. This is a rule concerning anyone who kills a person and flees there for safety. Anyone who kills a neighbour unintentionally, without malice or forethought. For instance, a man may go into the forest with his neighbour for to cut wood. As he swings his axe to fell a tree, the head may fly off and hit his neighbour and kill him. That man may flee to one of these cities and save his life. Otherwise, the avenger of blood might pursue him in a rage, overtake him, and if the distance is too great, kill him 
even though he's not deserving of death, since he did it to his neighbor without malice afterthought. This is why I command you to set aside for yourselves three cities, and after that, another three. In verse 10, do this so that innocent blood will not be shed in your land, which the Lord your God is giving you as your inheritance, so that you will not be guilty of bloodshed. The Lord established these cities, not only just to protect the fugitives, but also to protect the inhabitants of the land, so that their hands will not be stained by the blood that was shed. So coming back to the fugitive, as soon as he or she reaches a city of refuge with the right intention and a proper cause, the person comes under the immediate protection of the assembly in the city as directed by God. There is an assurance of safety and protection. There is also a judiciary process which will take place if the fugitive is found innocent of murder, then it's free to remain in the city and under its protection. This again is God's provision for innocent members of the community at large. By force of law, the fugitive is entitled to the city's protection. Now, this is very good, absolutely good. But at the end of the day, it is God-directed, but mankind empowered. God-directed and mankind enforced. And there are two setbacks in this situation. One, it helps only specifically those who have been in a situation where there's bloodshed or a loss of life. And two, its enforcement depends occasionally on the whims and fancy of mankind. Right? So there are two setbacks there. How then, you may ask, is this relevant to me in this day and age? You are not seeking refuge due to bloodshed or due to a loss of life. And even so, even so, there are law enforcement agencies that are not God-directed that can take care of this. Ah, but you look beyond the material to the spiritual. Look beyond the material to the spiritual. Let's take a leaf from King David's journal. What do I mean by that? You know, half of the 150 Psalms were written by David, singing praises to God and relating of his intimate relationship and his experiences with God. There are at least nine out of the 175 Psalms that David wrote that, God, that David personally calls God his refuge. Especially Psalm 18 and 57. They were composed by David specifically in relation to how he trusted in God being his refuge to save him from King Saul, his predecessor, and his enemies. God is more than able to protect David physically out of great harm, out of the pursuing of armies of even greater forces than himself and keep him out of harm in every, and sing, every single one of these instances. The word that David uses in these Psalms is the Hebrew word chasha, chasha. It literally means to seek refuge, to seek protection, to seek shelter. It also means to have trust and put a hope in God. You know, the Hebrew language has such a deeper meaning than the English language. It has got a feminine, it has got a masculine, it has got a past, present, perfect, and it's got so many tenses, and all the vowels are found in little dots and, and the dashes beneath the letters. And this meaning, this word chasa, has such great meaning deep meaning, that it also means that this person has got an intimate relationship with God. David has an intimate relationship with God. And it also tells me that God is the first person David turns to any time he's in trouble because he knows God intimately and trusts Him securely. It is this relationship of trust with God that David that gave David his confidence that God is able to protect and to bring him out of every difficult situation. My friends, this is the same level of trust and hope. I will want to pray for each one of you that you may have in your personal walk with God. The answer to my prayer for you begins with you asking yourself this question. Who is it that you always turn to first? whenever you are in time of trouble? Who do you call first when in times of trouble? Your best friend? Your spouse? Your parents? Your Facebook friends? Hopefully it's not your lawyer. 
But will you speak to God first? Will you speak to God last and every bit in between and keep on going back to Him? If you do that, then you know that God is your refuge. And God is your refuge because He's more than able to be your shelter and your protector. He's worth being someone that you put your trust and your hope in to be your refuge. This is an event that happened just recently. You all know about it. You read the papers, you go on the internet, you know about it. Russia invaded Ukraine in February this year. And when they did so, there were rumours that were abound that China would do the same to Taiwan. Well, because Taiwan, China always considered Taiwan as a part of a breakaway province of China. To be honest, Taiwan has every reason to be worried as it is just a small island off the coast of mainland China. You see the Taiwan there, the little tiny white dot down there? with China being so big. And the Taiwanese army is only a tiny fraction of the China People Liberation Army, which are millions. I asked my daughter and son-in-law, who were on furlough from the missionary ministry in Taiwan, at the time in Malaysia, if they were worried about going back to Taiwan. And you know what their reply was? With grins on our face, they replied, Nah, God is on our side. <laughs> then they added, Besides, there's big brother US backing Taiwan up too. And they've been back in Taiwan ever since. If Taiwan warplanes flying over, warships crossing the Taiwanese Straits, a lot of saber rattling. But it's been going on, but it's been going on for a long time. So as I reflected upon this encounter, I realized they were right on two counts, both from the supernatural as well as from the natural aspect of things. Of course, they were right about God being more than able to protect them, even, even, even if war breaks out. But just as important in the natural realm, China would be very, very hesitant even to just touch Taiwan in spite of China's military, economic, and political might. Why? Because of who is backing Taiwan up. Who? U.S. And it's not just mere say, because U.S. has kept a word by pouring billions of aid in military defence to Ukraine, which is very far away and has very little to do with US. But Taiwan has a, already a very strong strategic alliance with US, more so than what Ukraine has. Now, don't get me wrong here. I'm not making a political point. I'm not running for US presidency or anything, or senatorship. But in case you're wondering, I want to encourage you that it matters who is backing you up when you're in trouble. Who is backing you up when you're in trouble? Like China, leaving Taiwan alone with US backing her fully. No force or power in heaven or in earth will touch you when you have a strong alliance with Jesus and you have Him watch your back. The Apostle John reminds us in 1 John 4.4, 4, this, little children, you are from God and have overcome them for He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen? There may be some of you here today who are having sleepless nights due to some overwhelming trouble hanging in your mind or over your head or some others maybe in anxiety, in deep worry. Maybe not for yourself. Maybe for your spouse, your parent, or for your children. Make Jesus your refuge right now. Take the authority that is within Jesus. Be bold and tell the spirit of worry, the anxiety. Be gone in Jesus Christ's name. Amen? Be gone in Jesus Christ's name. Command it to go in Jesus Christ's name. For God is more than able to protect you when you make Him your refuge. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is more than able to protect you. And finally, we come to the third and last characteristic of the city of refuge. You will have an assessment and a fair trial for God is absolutely just. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15 to 21. One witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offence they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If a malicious witness takes the stand to accuse someone of a crime, the two people involved in the dispute must stand in the presence of the Lord before the priests and the judges 
who are in office at the time. The judges must make a thorough investigation and if the witness proved to be a liar, giving false testimony against a fellow Israelite, then do to the false witness as that witness intended to do to the other party. You must purge the evil from among you. The rest of the people will hear of this and be afraid and never again do such an evil thing be done among you. Show no pity. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Sounds like a bit of a harsh implementation, but it was for the good of the majority. Being entitled to protection, a fugitive in a city would also be entitled to a fair judiciary process. In the assessment leading to a trial, steps will be taken to ensure that there will be no perjury or false witnessing. As mankind could be prone to prejudice, favoritism, or even corruption due to bribery or biasness. And these steps include the application of the penalty of lex talionis, an eye for an eye, even to the witnesses as much as to the fugitive. And we expected that the fugitive or the accused should get a fair trial in which the blood avenger or the accuser would participate on one side and the advocate and the judges too with the defence witnesses on the other. The trial in a city of refuge could be taken as symbolic or a type of the trial before God who will judge everyone on the last day. And everyone that does not already have an alliance with the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, will have to stand trial. Remember earlier when we said, in a fit of rage, sometimes righteous anger, we would pray, Lord, remove all that's wicked, all that's evil from amongst us. It is said that those who know the Lord Jesus will be spared from that trial. But believe you me, we may be blameless before God on that day, but we are still not yet sinless. It is only to the advocate who stand with us that day, then we can be spared from that trial. So, we still have the propensity for sin, even today. I'm not talking about that day, but today. So if God were to remove evilness from all of the earth today, can you be sure that you and I will be spared from that? So coming back to the trial, on one side would be the accuser. That would be Satan that seeks the blood or the soul of every sinner. And he has been known to be very good at his job. However, there is only one and one advocate that can effectively defend every fugitive from sin that stands before the judge. And who is that advocate? 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator, advocate between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus. The man, Christ Jesus. Jesus had every fugitive sins placed upon himself as a man. And in doing so, paid in full for the penalty due to all of us. This made him and him alone the only mediator or advocate that could speak on our behalf granting us our freedom in God, our refuge. It is only through God's merciful provision of Jesus for the payment of our sin debt on our behalf by His death on the cross that God's justice can be met in full. By doing so, God is absolutely just while remaining merciful and loving to us. So my friends, are there any among you that have yet to forge an alliance with Jesus today? Is there any that came into this sanctuary or even logged on to the service online with a heavy heart filled with condemnation that could have been a result of some wrong that could have been rightly or wrongly attributed to you? You need to seek refuge. You need to find your shelter and your protection from the accuser in Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can speak with authority to lift this sin burden on your behalf. And Jesus is more, He's more than able to do so. Amen? Because the last words He said in Matthew 28, 18, before He returned to His rightful place beside Father God was, all authority in heaven 
and on earth has been given to Jesus, to me. If you have known Jesus personally up to this point in your life, or you have not known Him and you would like to do so today, let me encourage you to come forward after the service. I will be down there. Some of the pastors or the leaders will be down there to pray with you. Let me invite you to come forward, to speak to us. And if you do not understand or you may want to ask more about this advocate, Jesus, in whom we can find refuge, do stay back for a while after the service. But I believe the large majority of you may already know Jesus as your personal Redeemer. Or maybe even your best friend, as Pastor Philip Mantofa puts it in the song. Continue to find refuge in Him in times of need and trust in Him as you would surely trust, standing on the firm foundation of a solid rock. Say to Him what David said in Psalm 18 verse 2. Come, let us say it together. Say it with me. One, two. The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. You all don't sound very convincing actually. Come, let us all stand. Let us say it one more time. In closing, let us stand before we worship the Lord again. Let's say this one more time and say it loudly for Scripture. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. Amen. Let's say it together. One, two. The Lord, the Lord is, is my rock, rock my, my fortress, fortress, and my, my deliverer. deliverer. My, my God is my rock, rock in whom I take, I take refuge. refuge. My shield and the horn of, of my salvation, salvation. My, my stronghold. stronghold. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And when you leave the service today, when you walk out these doors, Shema, Jesus' word. His words that after proclaiming His great authority, He proclaimed the great commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything, everything I've commanded you. And surely, I'm with you always to the very end of age. Yes, Lord, hear our heart song, Lord, for it is a song that comes from the depths of our heart, the deep cries to the deep, Lord. The Lord, in all the things, in every circumstances, in good times, in bad times, Lord, we want to hang on to you. We want to call you our refuge, Lord, and we never, ever want to let you go, Lord God. So, Lord God, we want to attribute all thanks and honour back to you, to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you before His glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. And all of God's people who know Jesus say, Amen! 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 Amen. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Thank you for joining me today in hearing God's word and in praising Him today. The service is over. Thank you so much. But as you leave quietly, the altar is open for those who would want to come forward for prayer. The elders, the pastor and myself will be down there praying with you. Do come forward and we will pray with you. Hallelujah. God bless you. Have a great week ahead.